A Room with a View by E. M. Forster. Chapter 11 In Mrs. Vyse's Well Appointed Flat. The comic muse, though able to look after her own interests, did not disdain the assistance of Mr. Vyse. His idea of bringing the Emersons to Windy Corner struck her as decidedly good, and she carried through the negotiations without a hitch. Sir Harry Otway signed the agreement, met Mr. Emerson, who was duly disillusioned. The Miss Allens were duly offended, and wrote a dignified letter to Lucy, whom they held responsible for the failure. Mr. Beebe planned pleasant moments for the newcomers, and told Mrs. Honeychurch that Freddy must call on them as soon as they arrived. Indeed, so ample was the muse's equipment that she permitted Mr. Harris, never a very robust criminal, to droop his head, to be forgotten, and to die. Lucy, to descend from bright heaven to earth, whereon there are shadows because there are hills, Lucy was at first plunged into despair, but settled after a little thought that it did not matter the very least. Now that she was engaged, the Emersons would scarcely insult her, and were welcome into the neighbourhood. And Cecil was welcome to bring whom he would into the neighbourhood. Therefore Cecil was welcome to bring the Emersons into the neighbourhood. But, as I say, this took a little thinking, and, so illogical are girls, the event remained rather greater and rather more dreadful than it should have done. She was glad that a visit to Mrs. Vyse now fell due. The tenants moved into Sissy Villa while she was safe in the London flat. "'Cecil! Cecil, darling!' she whispered the evening she arrived, and crept into his arms. Cecil, too, became demonstrative. He saw that the needful fire had been kindled in Lucy. At last she longed for attention as a woman should, and looked up to him because he was a man. "'So you do love me, little thing?' he murmured. "'Oh, Cecil, I do, I do. I don't know what I should do without you.' Several days passed. Then she had a letter from Miss Bartlett. A coolness had sprung up between the two cousins, and they had not corresponded since they parted in August. The coolness dated from what Charlotte would call the flight to Rome, and in Rome it had increased amazingly. For the companion who is merely uncongenial in the medieval world becomes exasperating in the classical. Charlotte, unselfish in the forum, would have tried a sweeter temper than Lucy's, and once in the baths of Caracalla they had doubted whether they could continue their tour. Lucy had said she would join the Vises. Mrs. Vise was an acquaintance of her mother, so there was no impropriety in the plan, and Miss Bartlett had replied that she was quite used to being abandoned suddenly. Finally nothing happened, but the coolness remained, and for Lucy was even increased when she opened the letter and read as follows. It had been forwarded from Windy Corner. Tunbridge Wells, September. Dearest Lucia, I have news of you at last. Miss Lavish has been bicycling in your parts, but was not sure whether a call would be welcome. Puncturing her tyre near Summer Street, and it being mended while she sat very woebegone in that pretty churchyard, she saw to her astonishment a door open opposite, and the younger Emerson man come out. He said his father had just taken the house. He said he did not know that you lived in the neighbourhood. He never suggested giving Eleanor a cup of tea. Dear Lucy, I am much worried and I advise you to make a clean breast of his past behaviour to your mother, Freddy, and Mr. Vyse, who will forbid him to enter the house, etc. That was a great misfortune, and I dare say you have told them already. Mr. Vyse is so sensitive. I remember how I used to get on his nerves at Rome. I am very sorry about it all, and should not feel easy unless I warned you. Believe me, your anxious and loving cousin, Charlotte. Lucy was much annoyed and replied as follows. Beauchamp Mansions, S.W. Dear Charlotte, many thanks for your warning. When Mr. Emerson forgot himself on the mountain, you made me promise not to tell Mother, because you said she would blame you for not being always with me. I have kept that promise, and cannot possibly tell her now. I have said, both to her and Cecil, that I met the Emersons at Florence, and that they are respectable people, which I do think, and the reason that he offered Miss Lavish no tea was probably that he had none himself. She should have tried at the rectory. I cannot begin making a fuss at this stage. You must see that it would be too absurd. 
If the Emersons heard I had complained of them, they would think themselves of importance, which is exactly what they are not. I like the old father, and look forward to seeing him again. As for the son, I am sorry for him when we meet, rather than for myself. They are known to Cecil, who is very well and spoke of you the other day. We expect to be married in January. Miss Lavish cannot have told you much about me, for I am not at Windy Corner at all, but here. Please do not put private outside your envelope again. No one opens my letters. Yours affectionately, L. M. Honeychurch. Secrecy has this disadvantage. We lose the sense of proportion. We cannot tell whether our secret is important or not. Were Lucy and her cousin closeted with a great thing which would destroy Cecil's life if he discovered it, or with a little thing which he would laugh at? Miss Bartlett suggested the former. Perhaps she was right. It had become a great thing now. Left to herself, Lucy would have told her mother and her lover ingenuously, and it would have remained a little thing. Emerson, not Harris. It was only that a few weeks ago. She tried to tell Cecil even now when they were laughing about some beautiful lady who had smitten his heart at school. But her body behaved so ridiculously that she stopped. She and her secret stayed ten days longer in the deserted metropolis visiting the scenes they were to know so well later on. It did her no harm, Cecil thought, to learn the framework of society, while society itself was absent on the golf links or the moors. The weather was cool, and it did her no harm. In spite of the season, Mrs. Vyse managed to scrape together a dinner-party, consisting entirely of the grandchildren of famous people. The food was poor, but the talk had a witty weariness that impressed the girl. One was tired of everything, it seemed. One launched into enthusiasms only to collapse gratefully, and pick oneself up amid sympathetic laughter. In this atmosphere the pension Bertolini and Windy Corner appeared equally crude, and Lucy saw that her London career would estrange her a little from all that she had loved in the past. The grandchildren asked her to play the piano. She played Schumann. "'Now some Beethoven,' called Cecil, when the querulous beauty of the music had died. She shook her head and played Schumann again. The melody rose, unprofitably magical. It broke, it was resumed broken, not marching once from the cradle to the grave. The sadness of the incomplete— the sadness that is often life, but should never be art, throbbed in its disjected phrases, made the nerves of the audience throb. Not thus had she played on the little draped piano at the Bertolini, and, "'Too much Schumann!' was not the remark that Mr. Beebe had passed to himself when she returned. When the guests were gone and Lucy had gone to bed, Mrs. Vyse paced up and down the drawing-room, discussing her little party with her son. Mrs. Vyse was a nice woman, but her personality, like many another's, had been swamped by London, for it needs a strong head to live among many people. The too vast orb of her fate had crushed her, and she had seen too many seasons, too many cities, too many men, for her abilities, and even with Cecil she was mechanical, and behaved as if he was not one son, but, so to speak, a filial crowd. "'Make Lucy one of us.' she said, looking round intelligently at the end of each sentence, and straining her lips apart until she spoke again. "'Lucy is becoming wonderful, wonderful. Her music always was wonderful.' "'Yes, but she is purging off the honey-church taint. Most excellent honey-churches, but you know what I mean. She is not always quoting servants, or asking one how the pudding is made. Italy has done it. Perhaps, she murmured, thinking of the museum that represented Italy to her. It is just possible. Cecil, mind you marry her next January. She is one of us already. But her music, he exclaimed, the style of her, how she kept to Schumann, when, like an idiot, I wanted Beethoven. Schumann was right for this evening. Schumann was the thing. Do you know, mother, I shall have our children educated just like Lucy— bring them up amongst honest country folks for freshness, send them to Italy for subtlety, and then, not till then, let them come to London. I don't believe in these London educations. He broke off, remembering that he had one himself, and concluded, at all events, not for women. Make her one of us, 
repeated Mrs. Vyse, and processed to bed. As she was dozing off, a cry, the cry of nightmare, rang from Lucy's room. Lucy could ring for the maid if she liked, but Mrs. Vyse thought it kind to go herself. She found the girl sitting upright with her hand on her cheek. "'I am so sorry, Mrs. Vyse. It is these dreams.' "'Bad dreams?' "'Just dreams.' The elder lady smiled and kissed her, saying very distinctly, "'You should have heard us talking about you, dear. He admires you more than ever. Dream of that.' Lucy returned the kiss, still covering one cheek with her hand. Mrs. Vyse recessed to bed. Cecil, whom the cry had not awoke, snored. Darkness enveloped the flat. End of chapter 11